think we can. So, uh, yeah, cool. That's fine. Okay, so we start the the session uh, by introducing Roberto Serra from the University of São Paulo. ABC. ABC, sorry, Federal University of AB, uh, ABC. Oh, it, it is in São Paulo, the state of São Paulo. Yeah. But sorry, you were right. I don't know why. I, yeah, anyway, doesn't matter. And he's going to talk about uh, thermodynamics and reversing thermodynamics, error of time in quantum systems. Okay. The uh, clock, please. There is no time there. Okay, I have an infinite amount of time, right? <laughs> well, uh, considering you apparently can reverse the error of time, uh, yes. So, <laughs> okay, by the end of the talk, we can reverse it. Um, so, I'd like to thank the organizers and also this institute to provide us this very nice environment for discussions. I'm from this university here, Federal University of ABC. So uh, this name is quite fun, but <laughs> ABC means a region in the Sao Paulo metropolitan area, and uh, the university is specifically located in Santo André, which is a city uh, actually uh, uh, beside in, uh, from Sao Paulo. So I'm talking about some experiments where uh, we tried to uh, reverse the thermodynamic error of time, and I hope to convince you that we uh, get got some success in this kind of task. So I'm going to start uh, talking about uh, the system that we use to explore uh, thermodynamics of small quantum systems out of equilibrium. So we use uh, this platform, nuclear magnetic resonance system, in this kind of system, uh, we have a sample. We could have a solid state sample or a liquid sample or a liquid state sample. We opted to use a liquid state sample in this kind of experiments, where we have a kind of molecule that we want to uh, investigate, diluted in a solvent, in a deuterated solvent, and this is very diluted. In this case here, I'm representing uh, the chloroform molecule, but we can also have other kind of molecules here. In this molecule, we have a two qubit system. Uh, we have one spin one half in the hydrogen and one spin one half in the carbon. We replace the carbons here by carbon 13. So uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we have 100% of these molecules with carbon 13, right? And the chlorine here only plays a role like our uh, environment. And uh, this is how this apparatus looks like in the lab. This is our lab in Sao Paulo. Uh, Sao Paulo State, actually, Sao Paulo metropolitan area, we are in the ABC. So uh, we place this sample inside of a superconducting magnet that produces a magnetic field along this direction that we call the Z direction, about 10, uh, ab about 11.75 uh, uh, Teslas. And uh, uh, this uh, field will open a gap in the hydrogen uh, nuclear spin state, which is about 500 megahertz. And uh, in the carbon, we have something about 125 megahertz. So we can play with huge frequency fields, and we can prepare initial states. We can also measure the magnetic uh, through these uh, huge frequency coils. And then uh, we can also uh, time modulate these fields in order to control the system. So this is the typical Hamiltonian that we have for this kind of molecules. Uh, we have an uncoupling, which is like an Ising coupling between the nuclear spins. And we can switch on and switch off a heat frequency field in the transverse direction. And uh, this is the typical uh, signal that we measure. We measure these spectrums, which are related to transitions between the eigenstates of the system. So depending on uh, the the size of this spectrum, we can uh, get information about how many uh, of the spin, uh, how is the population of a given state in that system, 
and the coupling between the two spins is about 125 hertz in this case. And we have typical decrease times in this system, which, is, which are about seconds. So we have one kind of decoherence with it, which is associated to uh, energy dumping, which is associated uh, uh, to the amplitude jumping uh, 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 channel, and also at the phasing channel. And at the time that we have to spend to perform a pi over two rotation, for example, is about microseconds. So we can perform a lot of operations uh, inside of this decoherence time. This system is not good to perform massive quantum computation because, because it's not scalable. We can uh, increase the number of spins, but the spectrum will become very complex. And at some point, we have, uh, uh, we have to stop to increase the number of spins. But this system is quite nice to perform proof of principle experiments, like quantum thermodynamics experiments, a uh, very fine control, and we can produce initial states with very high fidelity, and so on. And uh, this is how we initialize our system in order to perform this uh, proof of principle thermodynamics experiments. So uh, we can uh, perform rotations, let the system evolve under uh, free evolution, and we can also uh, control uh, the phase in the system, introducing these field gradients here. And, uh, and then we can prepare a state with, with this uh, Gibbs state in one spin, and th then we can also prepare the other spin in the ground state, or we can prepare also buff, syst uh, buff spin systems in the, in the Gibbs state if we, we want. And uh, we also uh, ha have to take in mind that uh, this system, is the sample is very diluted, then we can neglect any interaction between the different molecules, and uh, we can treat the system as uh, a we can describe the system as the density operator of just a single molecule, because all the sample is prepared in this in the very same state, right? So, uh, and this this state is actually an equivalent state. We have a kind of a pseudo thermal state, but I will not enter in this discussion. We can also play with other kind of molecules. We also played a little bit with this uh, three fluorine molecule, where we have three fluorines that will play the role of the qubits. And to manipulate that system, we have to modulate the pulses in a special way. And we can also play with molecules with four qubits, and so on. And uh, let me just uh, tell a little bit how to define quantum, uh, how to define thermodynamic quantities in this quantum scenario. So in this case, uh, the thermodynamic quantities that uh, uh, we want to, to play with, like uh, heat and work, uh, or even enter production, uh, will be described as a stochastic variable. Because, for example, uh, if we change the Hamiltonian of the system using some kind of external control parameter, for example, in this case, we can use a time-modulated radio frequency field, uh, we can produce work that will the work that we have to invest to produce these dynamics uh, will depend on the transition uh, that we get from a given eigen state of the initial Hamiltonian to a given eigen state of the final Hamiltonian. Then we have different probabilities for different values of the variation of, of, of this the energy of the system in different histories. Then we have um, one main value of the work that will uh, given by a kind of distribution uh, which, which incorporates thermal fluctuations which are associated with the Gibbs uh, of the initial state. I, I'm supposing that I'm starting in a thermal state. And also quantum fluctuations which are related with these transitions. We can also define heat in the same way uh, when we have uh, open system evolution without change the Hamiltonian. So we can uh, define work in an ambiguous way if you have a unitary evolution, and also heat if I, ha I have an open system dynamics interaction with a reservoir, a thermal reservoir, without changing the Hamiltonian. When I have the both things at the same time, the definitions uh, become a little bit more involved. So, but there are ways to do it. Uh, and also we can use the information of these fluctuations in energy uh, we can plug it in fluctuation relations like Crookes relation or Zarzinski equality 
in order to obtain limits for a given process. For example, the Jarzinski identity and also crooks. So the Jarzinski is a kind of color, col corollary of crooks. Uh, also encompass the second law of thermodynamics. So the process, the kind of process that we will be interested in this uh, kind of, of, of uh, system uh, will be related to uh, changes in, in the Hamiltonian along the time. As for example, we can expand the energy of the gap of the system. So uh, we can consider, for example, a heat frequency field which is time modulated. Uh, so this field is resonance. So these os oscillations are resonance with the frequency of one of, one of the qubits, one, one of the nuclei, let us say the carbon. And then we can uh, modulate the intensity of the field and we can also modulate the phase of the field. So we can produce actively in our rotating frame a Hamiltonian that uh, is changing uh, the direction of the field from y to x, and we are also changing linearly uh, the intensity of the field. If we, we do it very fast, we will get a lot of transitions from the ground to the excited state, ground to ground, excited to excited, excited to ground. In this case of a two-level system, we have four possible transitions. And uh, here is the kind of frequencies that uh, we, we vary in this kind of experiments. And we can also uh, do the same evolution uh, in the reverse way. We can also, uh, uh, instead of increasing the intensity, we can uh, decrease the, 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 the intensity of the field and they also change the direction from X to Y, for example, if you want to implement a U dagger uh, evolution. Okay, uh, we can also see, uh, as our definitions of the thermodynamic quantities depend on if the dynamics is unitary or not unitary, we can also see how unitary is the dynamics that we implement in the lab. So uh, we perform a, a quantum, we usually perform quantum, state tomo a quantum process tomography in these experiments, and then uh, we can reconstruct the process mo uh, matrix, for example, for the, this kind of expansion, energy expansion protocol and the compression protocol, and we can see how it deviates from a unitary evolution. So I choose this kind of basis for my process matrix. In this basis, a unital process should be described by a real matrix. So uh, if you look for the colors uh, here, uh, you can see that this is uh, uh, almost real. S and uh, we can also change the time that, that we spend to compress and, and, and to expand the gap. Then we have different process here. And we can compare the process that we have in, in the experiment with the unitary close, closest to the, this process. And then uh, we get this kind of trace distance here. So when we do the process very fast, uh, we have a small uh, deviation from the unitary. In when we do this process uh, uh, in a long time, we get uh, a bigger deviation due to the fact that the the fields are not completely homogeneous. So if I want to do something in the adiabatic limits, I also have to consider this kind of limitation. I, uh, when I go close to the adiabatic limits, I will be more uh, uh, away from the ideal unitary dynamics due to the no idealities in the experiments. So uh, it's, it, it's interesting in this kind of uh, for example, if I want to do something in a continuous way, it's interesting to understand how I can control the entropy production during the dynamics, because my dynamics uh, is not completely unitary, for example. I can uh, get information about the energy fluctuations of the system using a kind of a Ramsey-like interferometer. Uh, it is also similar to the trace estimation algorithm uh, uh, in, in quantum computation. Uh, you can, instead of measure directly the probability uh, distribution of these energy fluctuations, I can measure the Fourier transform of this distribution with this uh, characteristic function. So the idea here is to use an ancillary system to encode uh, the fluctuations that I want to measure in a kind of a frequency or a phase. 
And then I, from the experimental data here, we are encoded in the magnetization of an ancillary spin. We are encoding the work that we perform when we do this expansion or compression protocol. And uh, taking the Fourier transform of the experimental data, I can have access to the work probability distribution, for example, but I can also do the same, I can also apply the same strategy uh, for heat. If here, instead of a unitary evolution, I have an open system evolution. And I can use this data uh, to uh, obtain information about the free energy, for example. I can use the Crookes relation. Uh, this is the, uh, the Crookes relation says that uh, the probability distribution for the forward divided by, by the backward protocol, uh, the logarithm of it should be equal to a line. And uh, we have this coefficient here, which is just the free energy of the system. So this is a way to measure experimentally free energy. The slope of this curve is the temperature of the system. So the temperature here is expressed in terms of a frequency. We can we also use it expressed as energy along this, this talk, but it's about nano Kelvin in, in our experiment. This is the effective temperature of the magnetic system, right? It's not the temperature of the sample. So uh, about irreversibility, uh, we always associate irreversibility to what happens spontaneously in the nature. Uh, for example, uh, well, okay, uh, all, all the microscopic laws of the nature are reversible, but we know that the nature itself does not seem to be reversible. And then we, we see a lot of processes uh, which are irreversible in our uh, everyday life, right? So Edgerton associated this asymmetry of the process in time, it's not the asymmetry of the time itself, uh, to uh, entropy production. So uh, we usually associate a process which is reversible to a process where we have a positive entropy production. When we have entropy production equal to zero, we can say that this process is reversible. And uh, a process where we decrease the entropy of the system, we usually consider that this is an impossible process. And uh, when we do it, we are challenged the second law of thermodynamics. OK, so uh, we also define the irreversibility, introducing a notion of distinguishability between a process and its time reversal, its backward version. And uh, we can quantify reversibility. We can qualify and quantify reversibility looking for this kind of uh, 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 distinguishability. For example, uh, if you look for a spaceship in orbit, uh, it will be very difficult to guess. If you look for a move of a spaceship in orbit, it is very difficult to guess if the move is played in the forward way or in the backward way. If you look for a move of a breaking glass, we can easily say that uh, in which way the move is played. For example, in this move here, uh, I, can, I can challenge you to say if it is played in the forward or in the backward way. So it's difficult to guess of, of what it is the direction that I'm playing this move. But for this other move, uh, you can also, oh, there is some sound. Uh, you can uh, immediately say that we are playing this in the backward way because you know that uh, breaking glass is a, pro is, is, is a process that will produce positive entropy. So playing the move in this way, the only way to produce something this way is to decrease the entropy of the system. And uh, I will show how to do it in the lab, right, in a quantum system. And we can, do, uh, we can characterize these uh, uh, notions uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, distinguishability of evolutions in a quantum system looking to the Kubak uh, entropy or the relative entropy of, uh, uh, of the state that you end up in a given protocol. Let us suppose that I start in an equilibrium state, in a Gibbs state, then I drive the Hamiltonian through an external parameter very fast. If I do it, and if the Hamiltonian does not commute in different times, I will end up in a state which is not an equilibrium state. 
in order to, to get back to the equilibrium state, uh, the system must to dissipate some energy to the environment, and the amount of energy that the system will dissipate to the environment is proportional to the entropy production that can be written for a uh, unitary driving as the Kubak uh, divergence between the evolved state and the thermal state for the final Hamiltonian. And uh, when we do it in the uh, in an adiabatic way, so adiabatic here means transitionless evolution, so this is the quantum adiabatic uh, a condition. There is a square here somewhere. And uh, when do it in the adiabatic way, if the Hamiltonian, is if the final Hamiltonian is different from the initial Hamiltonian, we still end up in a non-equilibrium state. So this, no, this is not the, 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 the usual classical thermodynamic notion of adiabatic evolution. This is the quantum notion of adiabatic evolution, right? And then uh, we still have to dissipate some energy to get back to this point. So we have a kind of quantum friction in here. We have a kind of uh, residual lag in this entropy production. And uh, we can do it in the lab. We can perform quantum state tomography along the evolution of the system. So these are experimental data plotted in the block sphere. And then here we uh, do this compression and uh, uh, expansion of the energy gap of the nuclear spin, and then we follow the dynamics of the spin performing quantum state tomography along the time. And here uh, we have uh, uh, a very fast process. We can see that uh, it's very distinguishable, uh, uh, the forward and, and, and the backward uh, way of, of the process. And when we do the process a little bit slower, we can see that uh, we have a trajectory in the block sphere which is closer so we produce less entropy. And uh, we can also have this kind of equality in time. For it, It's quantified there of time. So when we look for the this entropy production, uh, 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 this equality uh, is, is associated with the main value of the entropy production. We can also write, we can also investigate the probability distribution for the entropy production. And here for this compression and expansion protocol, uh, we have also negative values of the entropy production. So the mean value of the entropy production is always positive, satisfying the clausus inequality, but we have some probability to get negative entropy production. So a Maxwell Damon could select this kind, these histories of the system, could, could, could select these possibilities to operate in this side and decrease of the entropy, and decrease the entropy of the system. So I go very fast because now I have just four minutes. And uh, we can do it. Uh, uh, we can use uh, uh, another spin system in order to control the entropy production of, uh, of, of, of one of the spins, uh, forming measurements and then feedback. And in this case, we can generalize the second law. We can write uh, equality that relates information uh, quantities, theoretical information uh, quantities, uh, to the entropy production, and then we can use this kind of uh, this is uh, the, the the Kobach divergence. This is the variation of the von Neumann entropy. This is the information gain, the amount of of information that we gain when we perform the measurement in this case, Damon, and we can use this kind of equality to optimize a Damon. So this is the experimental demonstration of a implement of a protocol that decreases that control the entropy production in a system that decreases the entropy. Uh, in, in the system. Here we have negative entropy production. And I will not uh, enter in details because I'd like to show this. And uh, this is uh, the way to do it in a spontaneous way. So if we start with a system, uh, let us consider the smallest uh, uh, heat exchange uh, that we could think about. Uh, we could consider one spin in a cold state, another spin in the hot state. If we, we, we start with these two systems uncorrelated and we let them interact through a thermal contact, uh, the heat will flow from the hot to the cold, and then the, the system will end up in a warm state, in an equilibrium state. Uh, when we have these two systems initially correlated, uh, we could explore situations where this correlation 
could be using use it. This is the same thermal contact, right? That that I have here, and uh, we can use this correlation to invert the heat flux. So in this way, we are invert the thermodynamic arrow of time because this kind of process will reduce the system entropy, the local system entropy. And uh, this, uh, the idea of using this initial condition to reverse the thermodynamic error of time is not new, and uh, there are some discussions in, in, in some reference here, and recently uh, this idea uh, came up again. Basically, what we have uh, is the following. Uh, we can show that uh, the amount of heat that we exchange between the, these two systems is bounded by the variation of the mutual information uh, uh, of the whole system. So uh, when we have an uncorrelated system, uh, we can also consider that this system is a closed system, then uh, we can uh, uh, use energy conservation to write this in terms of just one of the heats, and then we see that this uh, 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 the heat that we enter in the in the cold system is positive, should be positive. When we have an initially correlated system, if the variation of the free energy uh, of, of of the uh, uh, mutual information is negative, if we consume consume somehow these correlations, we can get this reversed flux here. Then we can write, we, we, we derivated this trade-off for the heat current in terms of uh, information quantities, and then uh, we get this situation where we can compensate entropy production with this variation of, this, uh, uh, of the mutual information. So uh, the idea is to start with a system with this internal equilibrium. So we have a system A in a hot state, in a Gibbs state, the system B in a cold Gibbs state, and then we add some correlation here, which have a partial trace no. So from the local perspective, the system A in a is in a thermal state, the system B is also in a thermal state, because the partial trace of the correlation is zero. And then we let the system evolve through uh, jaloyzinski moringa interaction. So from the local point of view, this is when we trace out the other qubits, we have a thermalization map. Uh, we have a, another Krauss operators, which is not appearing here, sorry. <laughs> there are more two Krauss operators here. And uh, depending on the time that we let this evolution uh, 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 goes on, uh, we can control the degree of thermalization of the between these two systems. And during all the dynamics, we have a Gibbs system. And this is how we perform this kind of control of thermalization in the lab. We use uh, the interaction, the natural interaction of the system, and then we perform some rotations in order to simulate this Hamiltonian. So this is a simulation of a thermalization of two qubit system. And then when we start with uh, uh, a correlated system, we see thi this, is, uh, this corresponds to this uh, yellow line here. We see that the hot system becomes even hotter and the code system becomes even cold. And uh, we see that also the mutual information and also the geometric quantum discord is consumed along these dynamics. And then this effect of reversing the error of time uh, will uh, vanish when we consume all the non-classical part of the correlation. And then we get back to the normal situation where we have an uncorrelated system. So uh, we can also look for these uh, information theoretic quantities uh, and, and, and see uh, how uh, they place uh, the role in this reversion of the error of time. And uh, these are other uh, discussions, but I, I will jump uh, to the summary. So uh, we can characterize the reversibility in these quantum systems looking to these fluctuations in energy. And uh, we can uh, control uh, this reversibility using a feedback mechanism. Of course, there is no free lunch. We, uh, we have to uh, pay some price. We have to erase. If you want to perform this in a cyclic way, we have to erase the memory of the demon. But we can also do it in a spontaneous way. If you, we have a system which is initially correlated, 
We can also see a uh, uh, reversion of this thermodynamic error of time. We can also change the second law. We can add things to the second law, uh, taking into uh, account this initial correlation. And uh, But when we consume the correlation with uh, uh, the effect will vanish as well. But if you have a source of correlations, of if we have a source of correlated states, we can use it as a resource to take heat from one part to another of a quantum component for quantum technology, for example. This is one of the possible applications of this kind of effect. And now we are starting uh, to investigate more quantumness, coherent lubrica lubrication, for example, coherent effects in this quantum uh, thermodynamic stuff. So, thank you. Questions? Yeah, sorry. Thank you.